conspiracy theories video. Now, most of you all know this video is basically in response to hitting 3,000 subscribers, and I figured I'd commemorate uh, this wondrous occasion by doing my first one hour plus video here on the channel, hopefully the first of many, but I know 3,000 to a lot of people doesn't seem like a big number, but <laughs> for me it's a, it's a very big number, so I just wanted to say thank you all so, so much uh, for all your support, even if you just watch, especially if you like, and if you are of course subscribed, thank you so much. So today what I have for you is an hour of tinfoil at time, we're going to be taking a look at five of the most popular conspiracy theories around. We're taking a little look at 9-11, Area 51, Ancient Aliens, the death of Princess Diana, and was the moon landing fake? I remember off the, off the top of my head, lovely stuff. So yeah, they're the five we're going to be looking at today. I will put the timestamps down below of the we cover just in case you know you you fall asleep and uh, need to find your place again so that's the aim but like with the conspiracy theories here, videos here on the channel they're they're entertaining as much as they are relaxing i think so enough rambling thank you again for 3,000 subscribers and i really hope you enjoyed this video now let's begin with conspiracy theory number one so conspiracy theory number one is 9-11 so theory surrounding 9-11 now i haven't given this this event its own conspiracy theories video i've always been somewhat reluctant to and that's because it's obviously very very sensitive in nature in comparison to like alien stuff and like flat earth like ridiculous things like but like for a lot of people 9-11 is very close to home and so I figured I put it as part of this overall video but I just want to like say a disclaimer before we dive into it this is in no way to dishonor the dead these are just some crazy theories that people have put out there into the universe onto the internet and we're taking a look at them and we're debunking them anyway it's in no way to be disrespectful we're just you know we're taking a slow whispered relaxing look at uh, some entertaining theories and ideas because that's what they are they are entertaining but yeah i thought i'd get that disclaimer out of the way so let's uh let's look into some conspiracy theories surrounding the events of 9 11. so this first section is uh conspiracy theory surrounding foreknowledge so the belief that certain people knew that these events were coming we begin with suspected insider trading some conspiracy theorists maintain that just before 9-11 an extraordinary amount of but options were placed on united airlines and american airlines stocks and speculate that insiders may have known in advance of the coming events of 9-11 and place their bets accordingly. An analysis into the possibility of insider trading on 9-11 concludes that a measure of abnormal long put volume was also examined and seemed to be at abnormally high levels in the days leading up to the attacks. Consequently, the paper concludes that there is evidence of unusual option market activity in the days leading up to September 11 that is inconsistent with investor trading on advanced knowledge of the attacks and that was from the Journal of Business. This study was intended to address the great deal of speculation about whether option market activity indicated that the terrorists or their associates had traded in the days leading up to September 11 on advanced knowledge of the impending attacks. In the days leading up to it, analysis shows a rise in the put-to-call ratio for United Airlines and American Airlines, the two airlines from which planes were hijacked in the events of 9-11. 
between September 6th and 7th, the Chicago Board Options Exchange recorded purchases of 4,744 put option contracts in UAL and 396 call options. On September 10th, more trading in Chicago saw the purchase of 4,516 put options in American Airlines. The other airline involved in the hijackings with a mere 748 call options in American purchase that day. No other airline companies had an unusual but to call ratio in the days leading up to the attacks. The 9-11 Commission concluded that all these abnormal patterns in trading were coincidental. Pretty interesting nonetheless. Next in this section is Air Defence Stand Down Theory. A common claim among conspiracy theorists is that the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, issued a stand-down order or deliberately scrambled fighters late to allow the hijacked airplanes to reach their targets without interference. According to this theory, NORAD had the capability of locating and intercepting planes on 9-11 and its failure to do so indicates a government conspiracy to allow the ta attacks to occur. Conspiracy theorist Mark R. Elsis says, There is only one explanation for this. Our Air Force was ordered to stand down on 9-11. One of the first actions taken by the hijackers on 9-11 was to turn off or disable each of the four aircrafts on board transponders without these transponder signals to identify the airplane's tail number altitude and speed the hijacked airplanes would have been only blips among 4500 other blips on NORAD's radar screens making them very difficult to track on 9-11 only 14 fighter jets were on alert in the 48 states there was no automated method for the civilian air traffic controllers to alert NORAD. A passenger aircraft had not been hijacked in the US since 1979. They had to pick up the phone and literally dial us, says Major Douglas Martin, public affairs officer for NORAD. Only one civilian plane was intercepted by NORAD over North America in the decade prior to 9-11, which took one hour and 19 minutes. Rules in effect at that time and on 9-11 barred supersonic flight on intercepts. Before 9-11, all other NORAD interceptions were limited to offshore air defence in identification zones. The longest warning NORAD received of the hijackings was some eight minutes. American Airlines Flight 11, the first flight, hijacked. The FAA alerted NORAD to the hijacked Flight 175 at just about the same time it was crashing into the World Trade Center's South Tower. The FAA notified NORAD of the missing, not hijacked, Flight 77 three minutes before it struck the Pentagon. NORAD received no warning of the hijack of United Flight 93 until three minutes after it had crashed in Pennsylvania. So there you go, that's just sort of disproving this stand-down theory completely. They weren't given information in time and there was no way they could have tracked the planes as efficiently as they, as they usually would. So next, in the next se section we've got World Trade Center Demolition Theory The plane crashes and resulting fires caused the collapse of the World Trade Center. Controlled demolition conspiracy theories say the collapse of the North Tower, South Tower or of Seven World Trade Center was caused by explosives installed in the buildings in advance. Demolition theory proponents such as Brigham Young University physicist Stephen E. Jones 
architect Richard Gage and a software engineer Jim Hoffman argue that the aircraft impacts and resulting fire could not have weakened the building sufficiently to initiate a catastrophic collapse and that the buildings would have would not have collapsed completely nor at the speeds that they did without additional factor, factors weakening the structures I keep having to push my glasses up because evidently they don't fit properly in the article active thermotic material discovered in dust from the 9-11 World Trade Center catastrophe Stephen E. Jones and others state that thermite and nanothermite composites in the dust and debris were found following the collapse of the three buildings. The article contained no scientific rebuttal and the editor-in-chief of the publication subsequently resigned. Soon after the day of the attacks, major media sources published that the towers had collapsed due to heat melting the steel. Erinus claim that the combustion temperature of jet fuel could not melt steel contributed to the belief among skeptics that the towers would not have collapsed without external interference. So this is that that key phrase is jet fuel can't melt melt steel beams, and that is still a popular like phrase um, that conspiracy theorists quote. Um, but this basic claim is in fact because the combustion temperature of jet fuel is in fact more than 500 degrees Celsius higher than the melting point of structural steel. So, there you go. The further NISD, not sure what that stands for, did not claim that the steel had melted, but rather that heat softened and weakened the steel, and that weakening together with the damage caused by the plane's impacts caused structural collapse. And to further sort of cooperate their defence, since 9-11, at least two steel-framed high-rise buildings have collapsed solely due to the fires. The Blasco building in Tehran, in Iran on January 2017 and the Wilton Paisdale Maida building in Sao Paulo, Brazil in May 2018. Next, we've got some conspiracy theories about the Pentagon, because, of course, it wasn't just the World Trade Center that was it, it was also the Pentagon as well. Political activist Thierry Maison and filmmaker Dylan Avery claim that American Airlines Flight 77 did not crash into the Pentagon. Instead, they argue that the Pentagon was hit by a missile launched by elements from inside the US government. Some claim that the holes in the Pentagon walls were far too small to have been made by a Boeing 757. In response to the conspiracy theorist's claim of a missile hitting the Pentagon, Mete Sozan, a professor of civil engineering, argued a crashing jet doesn't bunch a cartoon-like outline of itself into a reinforced concrete building. When Flight 77 hit the Pentagon, one wing hit the ground and the other was sheared off by the Pentagon's load-bearing columns. According to Architecture Week, great magazine, go and subscribe, uh, the reason the Pentagon took relatively little damage from the impact was because Wedge 1 had recently been renovated. The pressure group Judicial Watch filed a Freedom of Information Act request on December 2004 to force the government to release video recordings from the Sheraton National Hotel, the Nexcom City Gas Station, Pentagon Security Cameras and the Virginia De Department of Transportation. On May 2006, the government released the Pentagon Security Cameras to uh, videos to Judicial Watch. The image of American Airlines Flight 77, which appears in the videos, has been described as a white blob and a white streak, and a thin white blur, and a silver speck low to the ground. A sequence of five frames from one of the videos already appeared in the media in 2002. Some conspiracy theorists believe that the new video does not answer their questions. Of course they don't and that concludes conspiracy
conspiracy theory number one, 9-11, some interesting things there, but we're not going to bother too much on it as we've still got four more to get through, so let's move on to conspiracy theory number two. Our next conspiracy theory is Area 51. We're going to begin this conspiracy theory by talking a little bit about a guy called Bob Lazar. Um, I believe he did a podcast with Joe Rogan. Go and watch it. It's so interesting and I kind of believe him a little bit. But the, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Robert Scott Lazar is an American conspiracy theorist who claims to have been hired in the late 1980s to reverse engineer extraterrestrial technology at what he described as a secret site called S4. Lazar alleges that this subsidiary installation is located several kilometers south of the US Air Force facility, popularly known as Area 51. Lazar claims he examined an alien craft that ran on an antimatter reactor powered by Element 115, which at the time had not yet been synthesised. He also claims to have read US government briefing documents that described alien involvement in human affairs over the past 10,000 years. Lazar's claims resulted in bringing added public attention to Area 51 and fueling conspiracy theories surrounding its classified activities. Lazar has no evidence to support his core claim of alien technology. His story has been analysed and rejected by sceptics and some ufologists. Universities from which he claims to hold degrees show no record of him and supposed former workplaces have disavowed him. Bit harsh, but he is pretty crazy. Like, if he, if he is lying, then he's just a mental geezer because the amount of, the amount of shit he's come out with is incredible. But anyways, let's dive into what some conspiracy theorists think could be going down at a Area 51, so we begin with UFO testing. Area 51 has long been rumoured to be America's main base for testing captured and crashed UFOs. At the heart of this theory is the Roswell incident. This was in 1947 when an occupied flying saucer was allegedly recovered from a crash site near the New Mexico town. The UFO and its inhabitants were said to have been taken to Area 51. The 1996 documentary Dreamland featured a 71-year-old mechanical engineer who claimed he worked on a flying disc simulator used to train US pilots. It was based on a crashed extraterrestrial flying saucer, according to the film. But others who have worked there say testing of captured aircraft was restricted to Soviet-built MIG fighters. Rumours increased when the base was used to test Oxcart, the codename for the CIA-ordered Lockheed A-12 recon plane. Annie Jacobson, author of the book Area 51, An Uncensored History of America's Top Secret Military Base, explains the shape of Oxcart was unprecedented, with its wide disc-like fuselage designed to carry vast quantities of fuel. Commercial pilots cruising over Nevada at dusk would look up and see the bottom of Oxcart whiz by at 2,000 plus miles per hour. The aircraft's titanium body, moving as fast as a bullet, would reflect the sun's rays in a way that could make anyone think UFO. Dissections of dead aliens and interrogations of living ones are also said to have been carried out at Area 51. There is, however, no evidence to support this claim. So we all just need to raid Area 51. Let's do it. Come on. I'll, I'll, I'll start an event in the comments. Let's do it. Let's, let's get that trending again. Another theory people think goes down at Area 51 is weather control. Huge areas of the US suffer water 
humans are on the threshold of expanding our reach into space, and places like Mars are in our sight. But the truth is, there's no evidence suggesting that aliens have ever been here, and invoking a supernatural explanation for some of the most monumental of human achievements means skipping over the fascinating ways in which prehistoric civilizations managed to make some of the largest and most enigmatic constructions on Earth. So what we're going to do now is basically go through these structures that many people, many potentially crazy people, um, believe that aliens constructed or at least gave a helping hand in making. So we begin with Saxay Huaman. Saxay Huaman, I think, is how you pronounce that. Outside the old Inca capital of Cusco, a fortress called Saxay Huaman rests in the Peruvian Andes, built from enormous stones that have been chiseled and stacked together like a jigsaw puzzle. Some say Saxe Waman could be the work of an ancient civilization that had a little help from interstellar friends. The 1,000 year old interlocking fortress walls are made of rocks that weigh as much as 360 tons each, and which were carried more than 20 miles before being lifted and fit into place with laser like precision. How an ancient culture accomplished such a feat of engineering is a fun little problem to solve. Turns out the Inca were as adept at building houses and fortified complexes as they were at watching the sky and keeping calendars. In fact, Saxe Huaman isn't the only example of this intricate masonry. Similar walls exist throughout the Inca Empire, including one in Cusco where a 12 angled stone has been carefully wedged into place. More recently, archaeologists have uncovered traces of the rope and lever system the Inca used to transport stones from their quarries to their cities, a system that relied on strength and ingenuity rather than alien architects. Next we have the Nazca Limes. On a high and dry plateau some 200 miles south of Lima, more than 800 long straight white lines are etched into the Peruvian desert, seemingly at random. Joining them are 300 geometric shapes and 70 figures of animals, including a spider, a monkey and a hummingbird. The longest of the lines run straight as an arrow for miles. The biggest shapes stretch nearly 1,200 feet across and are best viewed from the air, obviously. Scientists suspect that the Nazca drawings are as many as two millennia old, and because of their age, size, visibility from above, and mysterious nature, the lines are often cited as one of the best examples of alien handiwork on Earth. Otherwise, how would an ancient culture have been able to make such huge designs in the desert without being able to fly? And more importantly, why? Turns out it's rather easy to understand the how. Called geoglyphs, these enigmatic designs are made by removing the top rust-coloured layered layer of rocks and exposing the brighter white sand underneath. The why is a bit tougher to comprehend. First studied in the early 1900s, the designs were initially suspected to be aligned with constellations or solstices, but more recent work suggests that the Nazca lines point to ceremonial or ritual sites related to water and fertility, and in addition to being visible from the air, the shapes can be seen from surrounding foothills. Well, I don't know about you, but that how defence is pretty poor, so that, that hasn't really convinced me, I can't lie. <laughs> Next, of course, 
course we have the the Egyptian pyramids just outside Cairo in Giza the most famous of Egypt's pyramids rise from the desert built more than 4,500 years ago the pyramids at Giza are monumental tombs where ancient queens and pharaohs were buried but how exactly did the Egyptians build these things the Great Pyramid is made of millions of precisely hewn stones weighing at least two tons each. Even with today's cranes and other construction equipment, building a pyramid as big as that of Pharaoh Khufu would be a formidable challenge. And then there's the astronomical configuration of the pyramids, which is said to align with the stars in Orion's belt as well. Alien theorists often point to the fact that these three pyramids are in way better shape than others built centuries later, never mind the amount of work that has gone into preserving them over the past several centuries. So, are Egypt's uh, pyramids artefacts of aliens? Not exactly. It's true that scientists aren't quite sure how the ancient Egyptians built, built the pyramids, and especially how they did it so quickly, but there's ample evidence that these tombs are the work of thousands of earthly hands. Now, again, that's an even weaker defence. I'm not too sure about that. That's just them saying, oh, we don't really know how, but yeah, th there's evidence that they did it. I mean, I'll throw up some images on the screen now, but there's like loads of car weird carvings and stuff of like futuristic tech and like alien-like figures um, throughout the pyramids. And the Orion's Belt thing, you just can't. There is a theory, I explain it a little bit in my dedicated video on ancient Egypt conspiracy theories. But there's basically a theory that the pyramids are key, they're at the centre of like time travel theory. But I don't have the info on me now, but go check out that, uh, that video after this one of course. Next we have Stonehenge in my hometown UK, let's go. Never been there though. It, it just rocks in it. Anyways, uh, a huge circle of stones, some weighing as much as 50 tons, sits in the English countryside outside Salisbury. Known as Stonehenge, the Neolithic monument inspired Swiss author Eric von Dunnigan to suggest it was a model of the solar system that also functioned as an alien landing pad. After all, how else could those massive stones have ended up hundreds of miles from their home quarry? No one knows what exactly the meaning of Stonehenge is, but as with all the other sites in this collection, the explanation is not aliens, obviously. It'd be great if this article just for a curb and was like, yeah, the explanation is aliens, we, we got one in 4K. Um, instead, scientists have demonstrated it's actually possible to build such a thing using technologies that would have been around 5,000 years ago when the earlier structures at the site were built. And now it appears as though the stones are aligned with solstices and eclipses, suggesting the Stonehenge builders were at least keeping an eye on the heavens, even if they didn't come from above. Next we have, oh, another difficult one to pronounce, Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan, we're going with that. Teotihuacan, meaning the city of the gods, is a sprawling ancient city in Mexico that's best known for its pyramidal temples and astronomical alignments. Built more than 2,000 years ago, Teotihuacan's age, size and complexity can make it seem otherworldly, but it's very much the work of humans. Scientists suspect that over centuries, a mix of cultures, including Maya, Zapotec and Mi Mixtec, built the city that could house more than 100,000 people. With its murals, tools, transportation system and evidence of advanced agricultural practices, Teotihuacan is often considered much more technologically developed than should have been possible in pre-Aztec Mexico. By far, the most
most well known of Teotihuacan's buildings is the massive Pyramid of the Sun, one of the largest constructions in the Western Hemisphere. The pyramid's curious alignment is believed to be based on calen calendrical cycles. Calendar cycles, yeah, okay, cool. And then we have Easter Island, the enigma surrounding the Maui. Easter Island's fleet of large stone figures pretty much follow the same narrative as the other sites described here. How in the world did the Rapa Nui make these figures more than 1,000 years ago? And how did the Maui end up on Easter Island? Carved from stone, the nearly 900 human figures are sprinkled along the flanks of the island's extinct volcano. Uh, the figures average 13 feet tall and weigh 40 tons and appear to have been chiseled from the soft volcanic tuff found in the Rano Raragu quarry. There, more than 400 statues are still in various states of construction, with some completed figures awaiting transportation to their intended resting place. Reasons for carving the Maui are mysterious, though they were likely sculpted for religious or ritual reasons. It's not exactly clear what happened to the stone crafting Rapa Nui, but a leading theory suggests their civilization succumbed to an environmental disaster of their own making, which is something that probably could have been prevented had ancient aliens bestowed their infinite wisdom wisdom upon the culture. So yeah, obviously it's quite easy just to go now, it wasn't aliens, but I have to say the defences for the majority of these weren't super strong, so I mean I'll have put pictures and stuff on the screen so you can make your own mind up and I implore you to do your own research, but yeah. Um, there's definitely something fishy about the pyramids. I don't know too much more about the other things we spoke about, but, yeah, wow, just, it is crazy to think that they were able to do a lot of these things thousands of years ago, but hey, maybe they were just geniuses, or maybe they had ancient aliens backing them up, who knows, we'll never know, well, we might, we might know, but anyways, that is conspiracy theory number three done, let's move on to number four, the penultimate conspiracy theory. Conspiracy number four is the 1969 moon landing was fake. Now, I will concede that I'm not as big a, like, a proponent of this theory. If there was any conspiracy theory you'd asked me about, like, what do you firmly believe in, it was 100% this, being um, a history student, um, the, like, the overarching like historical context and everything just made it seem too coincidental that the US happened to win the space race and stuff. So, um, yeah, I firmly believed it was fake, but now uh, I kind I kind of believe it could be still, but I'm not as like I'm not promoting promoting it so much. That made it sound like I was going out into the streets with a megaphone, but. You know what I mean. Anyways, let's let's get into moon landing conspiracy theories debunked. The moon landings were faked. Apollo 11 didn't happen. Humans never set foot on the moon. Heard all this before. Yeah, from me on a Saturday. Conspiracy theories surrounding the moon landings have proved worryingly persistent in the 50 years since Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took their first small steps on the lunar surface. NASA's landmark achievement is still being challenged, despite there being a wealth of information online debunking these conspiracy theories. The cries of hoax continues. Why? So we begin with conspiracy theory number one. Shadows in the moon landing photos proved the images were fake. Take a look at the image, I'll pop it over you, and at the full panorama on the NASA website. Look closely. 
closely at the shadows cast by astronaut Neil Armstrong and another object just out of shot. What's wrong with them? They're not parallel. This image has been taken as proof by conspiracy theorists that the moon landings were faked. Surely, if the sun were the only light source, then the shadows should be parallel. Doesn't this prove that the whole scene was mocked up in a studio with multiple light sources creating different shadow patterns? The, the answer is no. This is on the surface of the moon, but we can reproduce this effect any time we want to on Earth, Professor Ojder explains. You have all seen this phenomenon yourself, where because of perspective, parallel lines appear to be non-parallel. If you are trying to reduce onto a two-dimensional plane, a three-dimensional situation, you can make lines do all sorts of weird things. Artists have been using this for centuries. Go outside when the sun is low in the sky and see this effect for yourself, just like the images from Apollo 11. The shadows will not be parallel. Conspiracy theory number two. Apollo astronauts could not have survived Earth's radiation field. Earth is surrounded by a zone of charged particles known as the Van Allen radiation belt. These are regions surrounding the Earth in our magnetic field where high energy trapped particles from the sun tend to get confined. What that means is, if you're going into these regions, there are extremely high radiation concerns. If that is the case, how did the Apollo astronauts travel through the Van Allen radiation belt and out of Earth's atmosphere unarmed? Surely the amount of radiation would have killed them. Doesn't this prove that the moon landings were a hoax? Professor Ujja as a killer reply apparently, so here we go, what you got for me, prof? My answer to that is firewalking, he says. If you've ever done firewalking, you'll know the one thing you don't do is linger around in the middle of the fire pit. You cross as quickly as you can. From a science point of view, as long as you walk across quite quickly, looking at the thermal conductivity of your feet, you are not going to have enough thermal energy going into the soles of your feet to burn you. You're absolutely fine, just don't hang around in the middle. In a similar way, the transit time through the Van Allen radiation belt right at the beginning of the Apollo voyages was incredibly short. Travelling through the Van Allen radiation belt, if you're going fast enough, which you, you need to be if you go into the moon, is no problem whatsoever. Conspiracy theory number three. Why are there no stars in pictures of the NASA moon landings? Here is another moon landing photograph which has caught conspiracy theorists' eye. If the image really was taken on the moon, shouldn't the sky be filled with stars? After all, there is no atmosphere to distort the images, no clouds to interrupt that glorious view. Conspiracy theorists argue that the lack of stars in the Apollo 11 mission photographs prove that the event was staged. NASA could not have faked the full wonder of the lunar sky, and so they simply chose not to include any stars at all. Here's another solution. Both the astronauts and the lunar landscape itself are brightly lit by the sun. The sky may look black, but remember, this is in fact daytime on the moon. If you're going to take a photo of a brightly lit scene, your camera's shutter speed needs to be fast and your aperture incredibly small. In that situation, faint objects like stars simply aren't going to show up. Conspiracy theory number four. The Apollo 11 US flag is waving in the wind, but there's no wind on the moon. 
one of the crowning moments in terms of US national pride was seeing the stars and stripes on the surface of the moon. Buzz Aldrin saluting the proudly waving American flag on the moon remains one of the iconic images of the Apollo 11 mission, a declaration of US supremacy over space race rivals the Soviet Union. But if there is no atmosphere on the moon, there is no wind. So why is the flag waving? Is this the proof that conspiracy theorists have been seeking? Look again at the image, and in particular along the top edge of the flag, and you will find the answer. A telescopic pole has been extended along the top in order to make the flag fly proudly. Yes, NASA really did think of everything. Because it's been set up like this, it appears to be waving in the wind. All the wrinkles are there because it's literally been screwed up for four days en route to the moon. There you go. Conspiracy Theory 5. If we really went to the moon in 1969, then why? Why have we never been back? Apollo 17. The last Apollo mission to land astronauts on the moon place in 1972. Since then, humans have never returned. Maybe that's because we never went there in the first place. Apollo 17 wasn't meant to be at the end of the story, of course. Throughout the 1970s, there were ambitions to establish a permanent lunar base before turning to the next major space exploration challenge, Mars. It never happened. But this was no grand conspiracy, this was geopolitics. The answer is we changed our priorities, Ojter says, they love him. From a combination of the Vietnam War, but also there was this geopolitical element of thinking, we've won the race. Just as we'd got good at doing science on the moon, we abandoned it. Instead, attention turned to the space shuttle program and latterly the international space station, which has been permanently inhabited by teams of astronauts since November 2000. But that doesn't mean humans couldn't return to the moon in future. And then this article just finishes with, the moon landings were not a hoax, Apollo 11 did happen, humans really did set foot on the moon. We have countless images, videos, lunar samples and scientific data to prove it. But more than that, human exploration has literally left its mark on the moon's surface. In 2009, we sent a lunar recon orbiter to map the lunar surface in three or four orders of magnitude, more resolution than had ever been managed before. Every single Apollo landing site was pictured absolutely stunning. What really strikes me about these images is that those footprints, those tracks of the lunar vehicles, they're going to maintain their integrity for millions of years. No matter what we do to ourselves as a civilization, we've really left our mark on the cosmos. I mean, it's a cool idea, but I still think it was fake. Like, as basically to briefly get into a bit of like history slash Cold War context. Um, basically, as part of the wider Cold War, you got the US versus Russia and the Soviet Union, and they were basically, it was basically a glorified pissing contest, Cold War, in that not a bullet was fired, but they just tried to outdo each other in loads of other ways, like, uh, like nuclear capabilities, and of course the space race. And Russia was sort of winning, and then out of nowhere, the US won, so I'm still convinced it was fake, but, you know, maybe I'm joking, maybe I'm not. And now we move on to our final conspiracy theory, the death of Princess Diana, and we're going to take a look at some reasons that people believe the crash in Paris isn't all that it seems. On the night of 31st of August 1997, something terrible certainly happened. 
Princess Diana was killed in a fatal car crash in Paris, and the effects would be felt around the world. But that is where the consensus ends. For some people, what happened that night wasn't simply a tragic accident. Instead, it was the result of some kind of conspiracy conducted secretly by agents of the British state, or something else, they claim. Numerous reports, investigations and experts have all agreed with the official account of events. That Diana had been in a car, driven by a man who was drunk, and that failing, as well as other institutional ones, allowed for the tragedy to happen. But others still believe that something more secretive and intentional happened that night. The conspiracy theories take a number of other forms but all claim to point to the same fundamental belief that someone wanted to kill Diana and they helped orchestrate that night's fatal crash. Those conspiracies were so convincing and widespread, helped by the Daily Express and Egyptian businessman Mohammed Al-Fayed, that the Met Police were forced to launch Operation Baguette. Patient. Baguette. An inquiry to establish whether there was any truth in the theories. It lasted years, cost millions of pounds, and found that the theories were entirely without foundation, and that all that happened that night was an incredibly unfortunate accident. The report examined 175 theories about what happened that night, some of them small and some of them profound. It found that none of them were true. Still, however, those conspiracies rage. Here are ten of the things that makes people doubt the official story of events, as well as the truth about each of the claims. Just before we get into them, that is crazy. That just shows how popular Princess Diana was, that there was this so much outrage and so much conspiracy around her death that the police literally had to get involved and investigate it like that to me that to me is crazy uh, and shows yeah how popular diana was because she was so anyway theory number one diana was pregnant this according to Mohammed al-fayed was the reason for the killing diana had become pregnant with his son's child he said and that idea was unpalatable to the british state mr fayed said the royal family could not accept that an egyptian muslim could eventually be the stepfather of the future king of england and so it plotted to kill her off discussion of a potential pregnancy came up even before Diana died, during a holiday in France a few weeks before. Some newspapers speculated that she might be pregnant, and that speculation was buoyed up by mysterious comments Diana made about a big surprise. But there was no sign of pregnancy during the post-mortem examination. Further tests on Diana's blood found there was no sign of pregnancy there either. And there's no evidence even that Diana suspected she may be pregnant. Numerous close friends and others said that her menstrual cycle was normal, that she was using contraception, and that she hadn't mentioned even the possibility of being pregnant to her confidants. There you go. Next theory, Diana believed she was going to be killed by the establishment. The main motivating factor behind the conspiracies is the belief that Diana herself thought she was going to be killed. And that much, it appears, is true. Chief among them is a letter that was disclosed by Paul Burrell, Diana's one-time butler, who said he had been giving it, given it for safekeeping. I am sitting here at my desk today in October, longing for someone to hug me and encourage me to keep strong and hold my head high. This particular phase in my life is the most dangerous. Is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury in order to make the path clear for Charles to marry, it read. The letter appears eerily 
prescient, and indeed it had a history. When Diana wrote the letter, she had experienced problems with her car, had voiced fears about them, and her bodyguard had died in an accident that she believed had been a conspiracy. Diana clearly had concerns about her safety. That much isn't a conspiracy theory, but there appears to be no official suggestion that she would actually be killed, even if there was animosity between some members of the royal family and Diana. I mean, one thing that struck me from that opening to that letter is, like I'm longing for someone to hug me, not to get deep momentarily, but despite Diana possibly being one of the most popular people on the planet, she was still super lonely, and I think that's what happens when you're part of the royal family, because they're just like so much higher up than everyone else in the hierarchy, in, in theory. Anyway, everyone's equal. Um, next, the paparazzi made the car crash intentionally. Photographers were blamed repeatedly and continue to be for Diana's death. The story caught on in part because it reflected a concern that had pursued Diana throughout her life, that the often prurient interest in her was causing her harm. This theory has three specific forms. The first alleges that the group of paparazzi chased and pushed Diana's Mercedes so that it could make the crash happen. The second argues that members of the paparazzi encouraged an environment where a crash could happen. And the third suggests that the paparazzi accidentally created a situation that the conspirators exploited to kill the people in the car. The official investigation pointed out that the paparazzi aren't really a meaningful group. Though they do the same job, they generally compete with each other for the best photo, for the best story. Many of them work for different companies and do entirely different jobs, with some working as professional photojournalists. Official investigations have found that the Mercedes car that Diana was in does seem to have driven quickly in part to escape the photographers, but Operation Baguette found that was the result of normal behaviour of the paparazzi and that they hadn't been participating in any criminal conspiracy. Next theory is driver Henry Paul intentionally caused the crash. Henry Paul was the head of security at the Ritz Hotel in Paris, but conspiracy theorists believe that he was in the pay of at least one other organisation, the security services in France or the UK, or both. People who doubt the official course of events say that its central claim about Mr. Paul being drunk at the time of the crash was not only false, but was a lie spread in the media to cover up the killing and that was done in part by swabbing his body with another person so that the toxicological results would appear correct. Interesting. There's no evidence to suggest that these things contributed to the crash in any way other than the official account. Numerous tests showed that Mr. Paul's blood had alcohol in it, though there were mistakes made with the tests interesting and repeated checks of those have certified that Mr. Paul had indeed been drinking. Next, there was something wrong with the Mercedes that Diana was travelling in. There is perhaps nothing more central to the conspiracy than the car that carried Diana, and which would eventually kill her. Conspiracy theorists claim that its route was blocked, that it was driving at an unusual speed, or that something had been tampered with in the car. Everything about the car appeared to be in order. People reported seeing different speeds, and the car was certainly driving fast that night, but there was nothing unusual about the way it was driving. But a large part of the confusion here appears to emerge from the fact that it is simply too difficult to estimate speed. Witnesses who reported different things probably weren't wrong, but it's very difficult to tell how far something is going when you're outside of it, especially if you don't have anything to compare it to. That is true. That is true. Bright flashes and strange vehicles were on the road. Numerous people reported seeing flashes as the car head into the tunnel where it would crash. 
flashes that were blamed for the crash itself, but the problem was that many people reported different flashes at different times from different places. There were a lot of flashes that night. The photographers following the car and the light of the headlights of the vehicles, but none of them appear to have been malicious or part of a conspiracy. And then I'm going to end with this one. Diana's bodyguard was killed off. Conspiracy theories around Diana circulated even when she was alive, and indeed the princess appeared to believe them. In 2004, US news channel NBC aired video showing Diana talking about an affair with Barry Managhi, a former bodyguard who she described as the greatest love I've ever had. But it was all found out and he was chucked out of royal protection. Then he was killed. I think he was bumped off. And that's a quote that Diana has said on tape. Conspiracy theorists took up that claim and suggested there was a mysterious driver who had apparently helped orchestrate the car crash that Mr. Manaki died in. He had been riding as a passenger on a motorbike. That bike crashed into another car that was coming out of a junction, intentionally, according to some. Cons rumbled on and became a part of the same set of beliefs that animate theories about what really happened to Diana. But the Independent found, after an investigation published weeks ago, that the truth was just as tragic, but entirely accidental. The driver of the car had actually stopped immediately and then agreed to help out with the investigation, including giving a statement to Operation Baguette. So, a lot of intrigue and mystery around Diana's death, but I think really it was just because she was such a popular figure and... But, although there is, and I think it's, I haven't watched The Crown, but I think it's covered a little bit is... Like, Diana was kind of resented by other members of the royal family because of her popularity and, like, how nice she was. But we'll never know. We'll never know. But, guys, I really hope you, you did enjoy this video. Um, I've been standing this whole time. I filmed it continuously. My legs are dead. I think next time I do a one hour one, I'll have to sit down. But it's worth it. Thank you so much again, everybody, for... 3,000 subscribers, what a ridiculous number, and here's to the next 3,000, and, and the next 3,000 after that. Um, so yeah, if you did enjoy this video, and you're able to, please do like it, subscribe.